Well, good evening. How's everyone doing tonight? All right. You guys ready to uh, dive into God's Word? Just want to say I feel very, like, overwhelmed with blessings this week, and so um, nobody signed any cards for stuff, so whoever blessed me this week, I just want to say thank you, because just an overwhelming is awesome, so thank you. Um, we're glad you guys are here tonight. My sister's here tonight. Yeah, all right. Okay. I'm excited for that. And uh, we're in Genesis 25, and I just want to uh, start by laying a little bit of groundwork. Tonight we're going to begin a part of Genesis that over the next three chapters, I'm going to probably teach it in a way that is the exact opposite to how you've ever heard it taught. And I'm going to teach it from the Hebrew and from the Hebrew culture. So a lot of times what American preachers do is they put it into American culture and they put a whole nother spin on what's happening in the passage. And so maybe for you, you've heard sermons on Jacob and Esau and the title of the sermon will be Jacob stole Esau's birthright. And that's actually not true. We're going to, we're going to look at it from a whole different perspective. So tonight I just challenge you that we want to be students of the word. I mean, you're here because you're, you're students of the word. So before we, we get, we dig our heels and we say, oh no, that's not how I was taught. Let, let's hold on. Let's look at it in the Hebrew. Let's look at it from the Hebrew culture and let's figure out what this passage of scripture is saying instead of just putting it into today's American Standard? No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> if you have that Bible, that's okay. I'm just joking. If you have that version of the Bible, it's totally okay. All right, um, let's just pray. Father, we thank you for tonight, God. We thank you for the chance to come and spend time in your word. We thank you that your word is powerful and alive and sharper than any two-edged sword. We thank you that you've given us everything we need to know within the scripture, Lord God, that you were intentional in what languages you, you wrote it in. You were intentional in what words you used. And so tonight, as we dive into your word, I pray, that, Lord God, that you would Open the eyes of our understanding, and we would see your word more clearly. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, so quick recap. Uh, Sarah has died, and Isaac married Rebecca. if you guys remember that. Uh, We saw Eliezer go. He was the unnamed servant, and he went and found a bride for Isaac. And so we're going to pick it up here in Genesis 25, verses 1 and 2 is where we're going to start. So... Abraham married another wife whose name was Keturah. Her, she gave birth to Zimran, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Okay, I'm sure I butchered every single one of those. All right, so Abraham takes another wife at 138 years old, okay? He has six more sons. But I just want to clarify, quick, and we're going to look at this a little bit more because there's a lot of other religions that claim to be the uh, the promise uh, the the promised descendants of Abraham, and they're not. And so uh, Keturah is not Hagar. Hagar's your blank. That's not who this is. There's no hint in Scripture that she changed her name and all of a sudden it's, it's Ishmael's mom. That's not true, okay? So uh, there's some religions that will say, oh, that's, that's just another name for Hagar. It's not, okay? So it's not Hagar, as some Middle Eastern religions believe. This is a different woman. Okay, so let's keep going. Verse 3, as I stumble over and butcher every name in this book. Jokshan was the father of Sheba and Dedan. Dedan's descendants were the Asherites, the Lesherites, and the Lumites, and the Medians. Sons were Ephraim, Ephur, Hanok, Ab- Abida, and Elda. These were the, all the descendants of Abraham through Keturah. All right. So uh, through, through this woman, you have all these nations that are born, okay? And so, uh, but what one of the names I want to point out is Midian. And Midian, if you remember, uh, will travel to a land. And so they, they named the land that they, they started after themselves. And they started their own little nations. And so the Midianites were where Moses, he went out to the desert of Midian and married a Midianite woman. And so Moses' wife has lineage back to, uh, back to Abraham, okay? Moses' wife. And so we talked about the importance of picking the right wife. Hallelujah. Okay, so 
picking the right wife. And we saw that those that, that, that uh, rejected God and didn't want God, and we're going to look at it a little more here, they found their wives in ungodly places, and those that pursued God went out of their way to find people with the right lineage because it needed to be a daughter of promise, not a daughter of the flesh. Okay, so just fun fact, Moses' wife has lineage back to Abraham. Okay, so I want to look real quick at the nations of promise. So many nations claim to be the nations of promise because they can trace their lineage back to Abraham. But just because they can trace their lineage back to Abraham doesn't mean they're the nation of promise. So let's recap real quick where we've been. Genesis 12, 2, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. Nation. God tells Abraham, I will make you a great nation, singular. Blank, you're, you're, you're blank there, singular. One nation. I will make you one great nation. In chapter 15, then the Lord said to him, No, your servant will not be your heir, for you will have a son of your own who will be your heir. So if you remember, Abraham, uh, is, God tells Abraham, you're going to have one son. You, you, this will happen for you. And Abraham and Sarah tried to make it on their own. And what happened? They produced a seed of the flesh, not a seed of faith. Okay? If they would have just held on, they would have had a son of faith, but instead they produced a seed of of the flesh. And we looked at in the Hebrew how Ishmael was referred to as the seed and Isaac is referred to as the son. Two different words, okay? All right. So then verse 15 verse 4, then the Lord said to him, "No, uh, oh yeah, won't be your heir." So they try to make it on their own. Verse uh, chapter 17 verse 3, "This is my covenant with you, with you, I make you the father of a multitude of nations." Multitude in the Hebrew is crowd, abundance, or a great number. Number is your blank. So after Abraham takes matters into his whole hand, own hands, God says, well, I'll make you a multitude of many nations, a great number, multitude, but I don't believe it was God's original plan. If, if Abraham would have stuck to God's plan, it would have been one nation. He would have had one son, and it would have been done. And so... Um, in uh, 17, verse 15, it says, Then God said to Abraham, Regarding Sarai, your wife, her name will no longer be Sarai. From now on, her name will be Sarah. And I will bless her and give you a son from her. Yes, I will bless her richly, and she will become the mother of many nations. Kings of nations will be among her descendants. So the word many is not in the Hebrew, Okay. So actually in the Hebrew, it just says, you be the mother of nation, meaning nation, the word goy, singular, one, okay? So Sarah's told you will be the mother of a nation, and from that nation, you will have descendants who will be kings and everything else. So it is through Sarah that the nations of promise are found. Now, there are other nations that claim to be the promise because they have lineage leading back to Abraham, but this is a false claim. It's not true. So then we saw in chapter 17, but God, verse 19, but God replied, no, Sarah, your wife will give birth to a son for you, and you will name him Isaac, great name, and I will confirm my covenant with him and his descendants as an everlasting covenant. As for Ishmael, I will bless him also just of you as you have asked. So who is the covenant with? Isaac, okay? Whose descendants is the covenant with? Isaac's, okay? So the Bible is very clear that Isaac is the son of promise, but there will be nations, there will be other nations as well. There will be a multitude of nations, but Isaac is the nation of promise. Okay, so here we go. Verse 5 of chapter 25, it says, Abraham gave some of the things, he gave everything. Abraham gave everything he owned to his son, Isaac. So I, I, I don't know if I wrote these like somewhat around the same, same time frame, but we're going to do truth bombs again like we did on Sunday, okay? So the first truth bomb for tonight is that Isaac's, Isaac is the only son of promise. Isaac is your blank. Isaac is the only son of promise. So whatever other religion claims to be the son of promise, that's not true. Because we have to go based off of just God's word, nothing else. 
Okay, but what's really interesting, and we'll go take a look at other areas too. But I have studied through the Quran twice, and the Quran mentions nothing about any of this. So the only place you would find out who the promise is is in the Bible, anyway. Okay, so you you have to go off of God's word as the truth. Okay, so we saw previously that there was a difference between the seed and the son. Okay, so verse six of 25 in verse 6 it says but before he died he gave gifts to the sons of his concubines and sent them off to the land in the east away from Isaac okay so we got to pause here for a second because what is a concubine and I think a lot of times we were like oh well that word means this not in the Hebrew culture it did not so in the Hebrew culture a concubine was different than how we would see it today A concubine then was usually a young woman who was exiled from home, and usually a wealthy man would bring her into his home as a daughter, not a wife. So he'd bring her in as a daughter to to take care of her. So Abraham is not sleeping with his concubines. They were people who were under his protection, and protection is your blank. Because there will be a lot of people I know... um, uh, that will say, well, why did Abraham do this? And why did Abraham do that? He didn't. You're looking at the word from an American standpoint. And back in that culture, a concubine was somebody that needed help. And they said, hey, come, come into my service. I will protect you. I will take care of you because I'm wealthy enough to do that. And so Keturah was probably a concubine that be, later became his wife but he's not sleeping with all of his concubine. Does that make sense? Okay, we're all on the same page. All right, so Abraham blessed them, but they're not included in their inheritance. Why? Because they're not actually his kids. They're the children of the women that have come into under his protection. So, yeah, he's, he's brought them in as daughters. So, in a sense, they, they're, they're like grandchildren. They, they've, been, they've come into the family, but they're not actually his from his bloodline. So so he's not actually, they're not partaking in the inheritance. And so they live in his home, but they're not actually his family. So Isaac is a son of promise, and everything is given to him. Everything. Now, up until this point, again, there's many years that pass here. We don't know. It doesn't, there's no account in our in the Bible or in the Quran that Ishmael had uh, any like contact with his dad. He sent him away, and that was the last we heard of it. And so Abraham invests in God's promise and separates everything from the promise. Now, I think what Abraham's doing here is intentional. He's getting his affairs ready because he's going to die. And so we're going to see in, in, a, in a, uh, next week that God talks about Isaac having dim eyes and not knowing when he's going to die. But every other man of faith in the Bible knew exactly that time was close. And so he knows the time is close, and Abraham sets apart the promises of God that God gave him so that there's no confusion or false claims when he dies. I'm going to go ahead and send everybody away except for Isaac. This is the promise. This is the inheritance. I'm setting him apart so there's no confusion. I'm getting getting rid of everything. And so sometimes in our life, you know, we... We, we muddy the waters. We know what the promises of God are, but we allow everything else to stay. And God has called us to be set apart, to set our family apart. In fact, in Deuteronomy 14, 2, it says, you have been set apart as holy to the Lord your God, and he has chosen you from all the nations of the earth to be his own special treasure. So point number one tonight is we, are, we must be set apart. Set apart is your blank. But I'm going to go a little bit further. We as parents in the room need, need to do everything we can to set apart our kids. Our, we talked about our, our legacy that we would leave behind. We need to do everything we can to set apart our kids from everything else. No, no son, you're not a part of the world. I'm setting you apart as holy for the Lord. All right, verse 7. Here we go. Abraham lived for 175 years and died at a ripe old age. 
I'm feeling kind of ripe right about now. I'm just not going to lie to you. Having lived a long and satisfying life, he breathed his last and joined his ancestors in death. And so Abraham joined Sarah on the other side. Remember we talked about the, the cave that he selected had one entrance in and one hundreds out. She went to go be with the Lord, and he, he goes and joins her with the Lord. If you have loved ones, if you're here tonight and you have loved ones who have died and they knew the Lord, guess what? You're going to join them soon. Hopefully later than soon, but you, you know what I'm saying. And so, but it says he's been blessed with a long life beyond 120. If you remember previously in, in, in scriptures that God promised 120 years, but he gave Abraham 175. And we know that he was blessed. Anybody remember why? Pastor's teaching on it. Obedient. Yeah, he was obedient. Okay. All right. It says he died satisfied. This word satisfied is the same word in Deuteronomy 8.10. When you have eaten your fill, fill is your blank, be sure to uh, to praise the Lord your God for the good land he's given you. Fill, when you've eaten your fill. I think of, um, you know, I'm trying, I'm trying to like eat healthier and like portion control. And like I've realized that as Americans, we could probably survive on a third of the food we actually eat. It's crazy because we just eat until we're what? Full, right? We're like, ah, oh, that was good. This week, uh, my, my brother-in-law Joe made um, uh, ribs with his own special rub and everything. And I'm telling you, by the time we were done, we all sat there like, Oof. we were full. And God says Abraham lived a full and satisfied life. And I want to tell you what was his life. His life was obedience and walking in faith and waiting on the Lord. And he died satisfied. So you, you're not going to live life satisfied if you're filling it with everything other than what God has. This is what we're supposed to take from this, that, that he died satisfied. And I don't know about you, but I want my life to fill, when I, when I come to the end of my life, I want to fill full and satisfied. Not gross and full of regret. Okay. Point number two, those who are set apart will experience the fullness of life. Fullness is your blank. I'm telling you, you want to experience life like you've never experienced it before. Choose you this day whom you're going to serve. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And I'm telling you right now, you will begin to step into greener pastures that are amazing. Verse 9 says, his son Isaac and Ishmael. Okay, what order was that in? Isaac and Ishmael buried him in, a, in the cave of Machpelah near Mamre in the field of Ephron, son of Zohar the Hittite. Okay, so what's interesting here is that the older in Hebrew is always mentioned before the younger. But here in Scripture, the younger is mentioned before the older. So Ishmael has come home to serve Isaac, to help him bury his father. Okay, he's come, as, uh, he's, he's come under Isaac as the leader uh, because usually the older would be listed first as the leader, but it was Isaac. And so Ishmael is serving, serving is your blank, Isaac, the son of promise. Now, Abraham is buried in the same cave where he buried Sarah. And just to clarify, so there's no confusion, verses 10 and 11, this was the field Abraham had purchased from the Hittites and where he had buried his wife Sarah. After Abraham's death, God blessed his son Isaac, who settled near Bir Lahari Rohi in Nagiv. Nailed it. All right. <laughs> so he, so we see here that, um, just to clarify, it is the exact cave that he bought for Sarah. And you're like, okay, well, so what? Well, the so what is this? Another truth bomb. You ready? God continued the covenant made to Abraham through who? Isaac. 
See, there's, there's, there's a lot of uh, other uh, Middle Eastern religions that believe that Abraham was buried somewhere else. Okay? Now, let's go to verse 12 real quick, and we're going to read through 17. And it says, This is the account of the family of Ishmael, the son of Abraham, through Hagar, Sarah's Egyptian servant. Here's a list of their names and the clans of Ishmael's descendants. The oldest was Nebaroth, followed by Qatar, uh, Ad, Adbil, Mibsam, Mishma, Duma, Mesa, Hadad, Tima, Jeter, Nafish, and Kadma. Awesome. Got it. Okay, keep going. And then it says, uh, these 12 sons of Ishmael became the founders of the 12 tribes named for them, named after them, listed according to the places they settled and camped. Ishmael lived for 137 years and then breathed his last and joined his ancestors in death. Okay. Now, Ishmael is where the religion of Islam comes through. Okay. Now, what's interesting is they believe that Abraham and Ishmael traveled, traveled to Mecca and built a, um, a shrine called a kebab, kebaba, something like that. <laughs> Sorry, I'm really hungry right now. <laughs> so, is what they claim. But what's interesting is, is like I said, I've gone through the, the Quran twice, and there's no mention of this ever happening and there's no mention of it in the Bible. And so the, the shrine they think that he built, I have an image of it, just so you know. It's like on my top ten list of places I don't want to go. Um, and it's like this weird box, and it's in Saudi Arabia, and, and they all worship at the box. Okay? But what's interesting is about these Middle Eastern religions is, like I said, I've, I've read the Quran twice. I don't know where they're getting this from. It's all, it's all lies that they've produced, and now everybody goes to this, lo like they do pilgrimages to this location to worship. So we know it's not true. Abraham was buried in Hebron in Israel, and that Abraham sent Ishmael away as a teenager. Okay. Now, it says he breathed his last and joined his ancestors in death. This is actually not a good translation. In the Hebrew, it reads, he died and was gathered unto his people. People in the Hebrew is am, meaning people, nation, or country, men. Countrymen is your, is your blank. So him and his mom left to go to Egypt. So Ishmael was died and buried in Egypt with his countrymen. He wasn't buried with Abraham in Mecca. Like, that's, there's no word that it even says that, okay? All right, so Ishmael's was gathered by his people, and sent, um, Ishmael was sent away. He was not gathered with Abraham in death. He's not in Machpelah. That's not, that what, there's no, no scripture that says that that's where he's at. And so, um, here we go, verse 18. And so in 18, Ishmael's descendants occupied the region of Hala to Shur, which is east of Egypt in the direction of Ashur, there they lived in open hostility. Hostility is your blank. Open hostility toward all their relatives. The statement is still true today. Open hostility on that side of the planet. Okay? So, before I say what I'm going to say next, I have to clarify. I'm not saying that if you are born in Egypt that you are a sinful person. Okay? I'm saying in the Old Testament that everywhere in the Bible, in the Old Testament, that Egypt was referenced, it was in reference to sin. The only time it wasn't was when Jacob comes, which we'll see later, Jacob comes, a type and shadow of Jesus as the Savior, and saves them from a famine. You guys with me? Everywhere else it's sin. So every, everywhere else that we've seen so far, everybody that has gone to, that rejects God, I reject God, they go find their wife where? Usually in Egypt, right? Egypt or some other nation, right? 
They head off there, and that's where they find their wife. So Egypt in the Old Testament, Old Testament, okay, not, not right now. Egypt in the Old Testament always refers to sin. Sin is your blank. It's type and shadow of sin in the Old Testament. So in Matthew 7, 20, it says, yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. Okay, so again, as we get in further in here with uh, Esau and Jacob, we're going to find out that just how they're described, you can identify them. Okay? Now, there's nothing in the Bible that suggests Ishmael is a godly man. In fact, very little said about him except that he is tied to the land of Egypt and lives in hostility with his relatives. That's all we know about him. All right, so Abraham separated the son of promise. Now we're in verse 19. Verse 19, this is the account of the family of Isaac, the son of Abraham. When Isaac was 40 years old, he married Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean, from Padan Aram, and the sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac pleaded with the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was unable to have children. The Lord answered Isaac's prayer, and Rebekah became pregnant with twins. But the two children struggled with each other in her womb. So she asked the Lord about it. Why is this happening to me? She asked. And the Lord told her, the sons in your womb will become two nations. From the very beginning, the two nations will be rivals. One nation will be stronger and the other, uh, than the other, and your older son will serve your younger son. Okay. So Isaac has to wait 20 years to have kids. All right? 20 years. Now another truth bomb. Even though he was the son of promise, Isaac still had to wait on the Lord, trust the Lord, and pray in faith. Wait, trust, and pray are your blanks. See, just because you accept Jesus as the Lord of your life, just because you want to walk in faith, does not mean you don't have to live a life of trusting the Lord, waiting on the Lord, and praying in faith. Yeah, but I, I, I was at church. Pastor Rick preached the most amazing sermon ever. I raised my hand and prayed a prayer. That's not in the Bible, by the way. And, and, and I prayed this prayer. Now, I've magically got my golden ticket. I'm going to heaven. I don't need to do anything. Life should be good. Sunshine and rainbows and Jesus riding a T-Rex. That's what it should be. It's not how it works. See, when you accept Jesus, you're not of this world anymore. Now you have to walk by faith. In every instance in the Bible where it talks about the uh, people's life of faith, it's always described as a fight, the good fight of faith or the race. I've been trying to run every day. Running is the worst too. Nobody likes running. I mean, it's just horrible. My wife's really good at it. I'm not, okay? Terrible at it. But that's what, that's what the life of faith, it's some race, it's some fight, it's something you have to push through. And just because you accepted Jesus doesn't mean you don't need to wait on the Lord anymore. Doesn't mean you don't have to trust the Lord anymore. And so just because you're obedient doesn't mean your life will be easy. And Ishmael, it's interesting because they show that Ishmael has 12 sons and Isaac has none. Just wait 20 years. Do you ever feel like the people that are like not living for Jesus have like everything handed to them? Anyone ever felt that way? I want to encourage you tonight. Do not grow weary of what is good because in due season you will reap a harvest if you don't give up. And trust me, the harvest you want is the son of faith, not the seed of the flesh. So Isaac's prayers are not answered for 20 years. 20 is your blank. Okay, so two nations, they will be rival, one strong, one not. The older will serve the younger. The word strong in the Hebrew is amats, meaning to be strong, alert, and courageous. Courageous is your blank. Courageous and brave. It is the same word used for courageous in Joshua 1 9. This is my command be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Deuteronomy 31 6. So be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not panic before them, for the Lord your God will personally go ahead of you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. 
So the word amats in, in the Hebrew, the word amats in the Old Testament always refers to spiritual strength. Strength is your blank. But not just phys- not physical strength, spiritual strength. If you have amats, you have spiritual strength. Or strength found by one who the Lord is with. See, this is why it's very important to read it in the Hebrew. Because if you just said, oh, one will be stronger, well, Esau was stronger. He was the hunter. He did all these things. That's not the word that it said. It said a mats, spiritually strong. And so the older will serve the younger because the younger will be strong in the Lord, and the two nations will be Israel and Edom. All right, so verse 24 And when the time came to give birth, Rebekah discovered that she did indeed have twins. The first was a was very red at birth and covered with thick hair like a fur coat. Gross. (laughs) So they named him Esau. Then the other twin was born with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So they named him Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when the twins were born. Okay. Now, they give birth, Esau and Jacob. Esau's name because he's hairy. And Jacob is named because he's grasping the heel. Now, this is where most common interpretations of the scripture will say that the name, uh, they'll say that Jacob, the story of Jacob, and he's a cheater and he's a deceiver. In fact, if you have an ESV Bible, there'll be a little asterisk at the bottom. It'll say that the the na- that the name Jacob means he cheats. If you have an NLT, there's a little asterisk, and it'll say at the bottom that his name means heel or deceiver. wrong I'm glad that they put heel in there, and we're going to look at next week what heel means in the Hebrew. Well, you have to wait till next week. But th- you got to be careful, guys. And I'm going to show you why. It's always important. Because, verse 27, here we go. Everything we need to know is right here in the passage. As the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter. He was an outdoorsman, but Jacob had a quiet temperament, preferring to stay home. Quiet in the Hebrew is the word tom, meaning perfect, complete, and morally innocent. Literally, the word used to describe him is morally innocent, and you're going to title your sermon, Jacob the Cheater. You done messed up, A.A. A. Ron, because you're not even reading it right. Okay? It means morally innocent. When the word Tom is used, it means blameless. Blameless is your blank. It starts to change the story a little bit. If you want to know where that word Tom is used, it is the same word used in Job 1.1. There once was a man named Job who lived in the land of us. He was blameless. Proverbs 29.10, the bloodthirsty hate the blameless people, but the upright seek to help them. So here's your next truth bomb. Jacob was blameless and moral, was a blameless and morally innocent man. Innocent is your blank. So if this is the words used to describe who he is, how can we have sermons that say something else? So Esau became a skillful hunter and outdoorsman, but Jacob was a quiet temperament, preferring to stay home. So there's a contrast. Now Esau was a man familiar with the wild. I'm not saying sin. He was a man familiar with the wild. Uh, We can do this. We get busy with life, and we don't seek God too. But the word hunter here means, you ready for it? Hunter. Who is the only other person up to this point, because we've gone verse by verse, Who's the only other person that was called a hunter? Nimrod. A little interesting that if this, is, if this is how that word is used, you have to associate the two. Like, whoa. That, that's interesting. They use, that only other time that word has been used is Nimrod? So, now the text here is talking about hunting, which is fine. So Esau was a man familiar with the wild. He was a hunter. Remember that the symbol for, for hunt was the bow, and it meant that you were um, you could provide for yourself and you were uh, self-sufficient away from God. He's a hunter. He can provide. He can eat. He can hunt. He can do all these things. I'm good. 
I can take care of myself. But look at this. Home in the Hebrew, because Jacob preferred to be home. Home in the Hebrew means a dwelling or home, the sacred tent of Jehovah. (laughs) Jehovah's your blank. You can't make this stuff up. So you've got one who is self-sufficient, a man of the wild, and you have another who is morally innocent, who prefers to be at the tent of Jehovah. Starting to change the story to me. I don't know about you. So the word, the word for home is derived from the word Elohim, the tent or the place of God. And so he was morally innocent, and he was he preferred to be around the presence of God. He preferred to stay home. I want to be he, I want to be where God is. Genesis 25, verse 28. Here we go. Isaac loved Esau because he enjoyed eating the wild game, but Esau, that the game Esau brought home, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Now we're going to look at this more next week because we're going to back up, start over, and go further next week. But Isaac favored Esau because of the food he brought. Isaac loved Esau for fleshly reasons. But Rebecca just loved Jacob. No reasons given. Any moms in the room know that. You don't need a reason to love your kid. Right? And so God had already told Rebecca what was in her womb, that one would be strong in the Lord. At this point, Rebecca is fully aware who's who. Fully aware. And so... Esau, a physical man of the wild, and Jacob, a sensitive man to the Lord, and she knows. Verse 29, here we go, 29. One day when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau arrived home from the wilderness, exhausted and hungry. Esau said to Jacob, I'm starved. Give me some of your red stew. This is how Esau got his name, his other name, Edom, which means red. So Edom is the name of Esau's descendants. In Obadiah 1.8, at that time, not a single person will be left in the whole land of Edom, says the Lord. For the mountains of Edom, I will destroy everyone who has understanding. Doesn't sound like these are godly people that God is talking about. So Edom did not become the people of promise. There's nothing in Scripture that suggests Esau or Edom were godly people, but in fact, it suggests the exact opposite, as we will see. Verse 31 In verse 31, all right, Jacob replied, but trade me your rights as firstborn son. Look, I'm dying of starvation, Esau, said Esau. What good is my birthright to me now? Okay, truth bomb number two. Jacob is not tricking Esau. Jacob is pursuing God's blessings. Pursuing is the blank. I want that, I want the blessings. I want my descendants. Understand something. This is not... They're not fighting over uh, inheritance. I want the house, right? I want all the guns. You can have. Uh, <laughs> you you can have the motorcycles. You can have the house. You know, like wait, wait, like uh, that's my sister. Okay, we're not fighting over who gets what of mom and dad's if they die. They're fighting over who is blessed, whose children's children, children, will be the promise. That's what people, people like think that he stole like his inheritance. No, he stole a blessing. And to Esau, the blessing means nothing. But to Jacob, it means everything. So were Isaac and Rebekah poor people? No. Abraham gave Isaac everything he owned. Esau could have had a servant make food for him. I'm starving. Make me food. We, we, we've done... Seven day fast, 21 day fast. I'm going to tell you right now, he's not about to die. Now, if you ask my son Noah, he is. I'm starving, Dad. I'm going to die. You ate four hours ago. He could easily ask his servant to, to make him food. So, truth bomb again. Esau wanted what he wanted now and was willing to give away his spiritual heritage 
to live in the moment. This is huge. Hebrews eleven twenty one. It was by faith that Esau, Jacob. It was by faith that Jacob, when he was old and dying, blessed each of his of Joseph's sons. So Jacob is pursuing the birthright, God's blessing that will last for generations and generations and generations and generations. And Esau could care less; he wants to live in the moment. And so, whoever's going to play for me, if you want to come up, we're going to close. But Esau says, what good is this birthright to me now? And point number three tonight is this. What we focus on now has eternal results. Eternal is your blank. What you focus on right now in your home will have results that go from generations to generations to generations. We say church is the best thing you can do for your family. Why? We are helping you to pass down to generations, to generations, to generations. What we focus on right now will have eternal reward or eternal consequences. We talked on Sunday about people that say, hey, I'm just trying to change my life. I'm trying to change my life. I'm trying to change my life. And we said the other side of the coin was humble yourself before the Lord. To humbly accept his word. To pursue the things of God and watch it transform you. Philippians 3.13 says, but I focus on one thing. How many things? Forgetting the past, all those regrets, all those mistakes, forgetting them. I forget the past. All the hiccups and road bumps and things you re- wish you never did. I forget the past. Looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race. You, you got to run, people, if you're going to be in a race. I mean, I guess you could be in a walking race, but that's weird. And receive what kind of prize? Heavenly prize. I'm going to forget what was behind. And I'm going to pursue the promises of God. And we're going to see next week what the word heal means. What the word Jacob, the name Jacob means. Don't miss the eternal reward because you want to live in the now. Verse 33. But Jacob said, first you must swear that your birthright is mine. So Esau swore an oath, thereby selling all his rights as firstborn to his brother Jacob. You cannot steal something you bought and paid for. Goes on in 34. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and lentil stew. Esau ate the meal, then got up and left. He showed contempt for his rights as firstborn son. Contempt is your blank. He showed contempt. Your version of the Bible might say he despised the things of God. Want nothing to do with that. I don't care. Who cares? I want what I want now. He despised them. Truth bomb. Esau despised the blessings of God. Despised is your blank. John 15, 18 says, If the world hates you, remember it hated me first. The world would love you as its own if it, if you belong to it, but you were no longer part of the world I chose you to come out of the world so it hates you. Esau despised the things of God because he wanted what was in the world. He wanted what was now. The world will always hate the things of God. Hate is your blank. 
and we're going to pick up next week and we're going to look more closely but Jacob did not cheat he was morally innocent he pursued the things of God and Esau despised the things of God and gave them away tonight my challenge to you is this where do your priorities lie tonight as, as parents, as families, as young people, where do your priorities lie right now? What do you live for? Parents in the room, are you spiritually setting up our children and our children's children? Because what you pursue now will have eternal impact. Stand with me tonight. We're going to pray tonight for our families. But before we do, maybe you're here in the room and your focus has been, is you've been busy. You know, it, it didn't say that Esau pursued sin. It just said he, he loved the wild. He loved hunting. He loved doing all these other things. And he despised the blessings of God. Have we been too busy to pursue God? So before we pray for our families, we need to take care of business ourselves. Can we do that tonight? Just right where you are, just close your eyes, just raise your hands up. Father God, we thank you for tonight. God, we thank you for the chance to push the restart button. From this moment forward, forgetting what was behind, we are going to run to what is ahead. We are going to pursue what is ahead. Pursuing you. Father, I pray that we would run our race in such a way that we would win. Father, I pray that those in the room, those in the room that are tired and weary, if you were tired and weary in the room right now, just, just give it to God right where you're at. I am tired and I'm weary. Father, I pray, Lord God, that you would put a spirit of endurance in them. They would not give up, but they would reap the harvest that is on the way. The harvest is coming. Isaac had to wait 20 years. Abraham had to wait 100 years. But God is always faithful for all the promises in him are yes and amen. So, Father, right now where we are, we let go of the past. Father, I pray for a spiritual just recharge right now in this place.